My name is Professor Phil Stricker, and it's a great honor to give a presentation on MRI of the prostate, what the urologist needs. I have no financial interests or relationships to declare. Prostate cancer is complicated at the moment in that digital rectal examination, PSA and biopsy are all notoriously inaccurate. Not only that, but the, de the definition of an insignificant or significant cancer is highly controversial and variable and dependent on old transrectal biopsy definitions. MRI has revolutionized this area. This lesion would have previously not been seen and a biopsy blind would have shown a Gleason 6 tumor, but a targeted biopsy shows a Gleason 3 plus 4, 7 tumor, clearly more accurately assessing the prostate. Prostate cancer has many treatments, not only surgery, brachytherapy, radiotherapy, high dose rate brachytherapy, active surveillance and vocal therapy. And this has further complicated the area of prostate cancer. <clears throat> MRI has many potential roles in prostate cancer. Firstly, as a second line screening tool. Secondly, to help targeting in biopsy. Thirdly, as a reassurance in patients who've had a negative biopsy with an increasing PSA. Also in choosing therapy, in preparing for operations and radiotherapy, in active surveillance, the assessment of oligometastatic disease and focal therapy. And at the end of this talk, I'd like to talk a little bit about the future. The reason for including, including MRI in the screening algorithm is to decrease the number of unnecessary biopsies, decrease overdetection, aiding in localization and extent of cancer, earlier detection of cancer in high-risk patients, reassurance of older patients with increased PSA, more accurate biopsy and grading, using the ADC level as a potential prognostic aid, and using serial PSAs, which could help in incremental change in the very high-risk patient, such as the BRCA2 patient. One of the big questions is, can we avoid biopsying patients who have a negative or pyrade one or two case? This has been shown to be the case in 93 to 96% of cases. The most recent prominent study was the PROMISE study, showing similar data to our data of Thompson and now. The PROMISE study was published in The Lancet three years ago, and it showed that when comparing transrectal ultrasound biopsy to MRI targeting, that MRI targeting not only decreased the number of unnecessary biopsies, but did not decrease the number of significant cancers detected. It has one problem, however, that the positive predictive value of MRI still remains low at 50%. The negative predictive value, however, is very high. And so a negative MRI is a very useful tool. Another major study was recently published by Kazibernefdanen, and that was done in 2018 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it showed that MR targeting is a better paradigm than blind transrectal ultrasound. It showed that it resulted in fewer significant cancers missed, fewer insignificant cancers diagnosed, fewer men biopsied, fewer needle deployments, more representative pathology, less harm, and it's almost certainly less cost. As a result of this last year, the 
National Institute of Clinical Excellence, NICE, recommended offering MRI as the first line investigation for people with suspected clinically localized cancer and report the results using a five point scale. It also recommended that a biopsy is recommended for people whose scale is three or more. And it recommended considering avoiding biopsy in those patients with a scale of one to two. In one of the studies that we actually did in the Journal of Urology, uh, similar to the PROMISE study, we showed that if a negative MRI deferred biopsy, we could avoid an unnecessary biopsy in almost 50% of patients. And only 1.4% would have a delay in diagnosis. Recently, we published on the nomogram, which used MRI in addition. The MRI nomogram showed that if you use PSA, digital examination, prostate volume, age, and the MRI, the area under. Recently, we published on the nomogram of MRI and that was shown to improve the accuracy of predicting a significant cancer when added to the PSA, age, family history and doubling time, as well as the prostate volume. Another trial which is being planned at the moment is the reimagine trial, which Ask the question whether MRI could indeed be used as a screening tool. And part one was to look at a thousand men with a raised PSA and then do MRIs and high tech, high tech diagnostic tests. And part two would screen 300 men between 50 and 75 with a raised PSA with a 10 minute MRI, essentially a biparametric MRI. One caution. There has been quite considerable publications about the variation between radiologists reporting. And I think it's mandatory that a high standard of radiology reporting on MRI is essential. The PROMISE study, as we mentioned, showed a poor positive predictive value. And this may open up the way for PSMA PET scanning in identifying significant cancer in patients with uh, a a PIRAD3 or PIRAD4 lesion. We recently published on using one of the trials that we're entertaining at the moment, and in fact is uh, currently accruing, is the primary trial where an MRI and a PSMA PET scan is being used before biopsy to see what additive value. An M a P a, sorry, a PSMA PET scan will add to the MRI. We've also recently published on the value of PSMA PET scan inside the prostate, and this is an interesting emerging field. This is an example of a patient who had a negative MRI and a positive PSMA and was found to have a high grade cancer. In addition, PSMA PET MRI fusion has been shown to potentially be an excellent way of using one imaging modality to assess the prostate to decrease the positive, or sorry, to increase the positive predictive value. Biopsies have been controversial. One of the questions is, is the current biopsy technique of transrectal biopsy adequate? Is MRI biopsy better? And I think this has been shown quite clearly in the precision and promise trial. Which is the best MRI guided tech technique? Do all patients need MRI guided biopsy? And should we still biopsy the rest of the prostate? The problem with current techniques 
is that transrectal biopsy misses cancers, detects clinically insignificant cancers, and doesn't get the heart of the cancer, therefore undergrading it. Transperineal biopsy has been shown to be safer and more accurate and aid in MRI ultrasound fusion techniques and makes it able to, to biopsy areas of the prostate that the transrectal biopsy often can't get to. With fusion, we are able to fuse the MRI image to the ultrasound image and do a more targeted biopsy. This is often done transperineally, but it's slightly less accurate than the ingrant gantry biopsy, but it's safer because it's transperineal biopsy, but it still has a learning curve. It's convenient to the urologist because he's familiar with the transperineal technique. And it also allows the transperineal template biopsy at the same time, which is mandatory if focal therapy is being considered. In gantry, however, is the most accurate and verifiable technique. However, it's transrectal, it's slightly unpleasant for the patient, and it's more costly being inside an MRI machine. My selection at the moment for very large lesions, I simply use a cognitive transperineal biopsy technique. For intermediate sized lesions, I use an MR fusion transperineal technique. And for very small lesions, I use the MR gantry technique. I still um, take template biopsies at the same time because I offer a focal therapy program in addition to a whole gland therapy program. A recent meta-analysis, however, showed that in gantry biopsies and fusion biopsies were about equal in accuracy, but it did confirm that the cognitive biopsy was less accurate. In patients who've had previous negative biopsies but a high PSA, the anterior so-called evasive tumor is often found. Now to surgical and radiotherapy and treatment planning. When we plan surgery, we use all the information, including clinical biopsy and imaging. We decide on the degree of nerve sparing, where to go wide, what extent of node dissection we do, the likelihood of incontinence. We assess the biopsy, whether there's understaging, and we try and use all this for accurate preoperative counseling. For example, in this case, with the cancer near the, neuro, near the edge of the prostate, we go wider at this point surgically. In this case, where the cancer is posterior, we take Devon Villiers fascia to achieve a clear margin. In this case, in this case where the cancer is extending. In this case, where the neurovascular bundle is invaded, we have to do an extra fascial wide resection. The neurovascular bundle is a complex one centimeter organ with nerves, blood vessels, veins, and fat. The degree of nerve sparing can be seen on the bottom right and it's not an all or nothing thing. So using the MRI and the biopsy information and the clinical and the operative findings helps us decide what degree of nerve sparing we do. Extracapsular extension is a very important factor. And whilst we can use all the first five factors in this slide to predict extracapsular extension, in my experience, a long contact area on the edge of the uh, capsule highly predicts extracapsular disease. Here you can see extracapsular the most disease. The of extracapsular disease is a very broad front against the capsule.
In this particular case, there is a large amount of extracapsular disease anteriorly. And here, the likelihood of clearing this with surgery is low and therefore we give preoperative warning that adjuvant radiotherapy may be necessary. In this patient with extremely extensive extracapsular disease at the apex, this is very difficult to cure with surgery without the damaging the sphincter. And here, this person may be best treated with high dose rate brachytherapy. In this case, where the seminal vesicles are involved, wide resection of that area with surgery and the possibility of adjuvant radiotherapy may be necessary. High dose rate brachytherapy is unable to reach this area. The length of the sphincteric urethra can also predict the likelihood of urinary control return after surgery. Lymph nodes have been problematic for some time in the pelvis. 68% are less than five millimeters, 60% are not detected by current imaging, 13% are not even detected by an extended lymph gland dissection. 50% are outside the typical radiotherapy fields. The typical lymph nodes that we dissect or look at are the obturator, the external iliac, the internal iliac, the presacral, the pararectal, and the common iliac to a less degree. An abnormal node on MRI is typically greater than 10 millimeters if oval and greater than eight millimeters if round. But unfortunately, most lymph glands metastases are too small for MRI to resolve. One of the attempts to improve that has been Combidex MRI, which injects small particles of iron oxide to fill the lymph node. And then we look at the negative filling defect to assume that that's a tumor. And this was popular about five to 10 years ago and is still the subject of intense investigation. Here is some positive nodes with the Combidex MRI, and it's allegedly able to get down to two millimeters in size. PSMA PET scan really has a big role in lymph gland metastases, but again, it's not perfect. Conventional CT scan and bone scan are unreliable in early metastatic disease, and PSMA PET scan is able to detect lymph gland metastases four millimeters and larger, which is better than the MRI. It identifies the site of recurrence post-radical prostatectomy as well, particularly when the PSA has risen to 0.2 in about 50% of cases. And it has the potential to enable early targeted therapy and may aid MRI and screening. With particular attention to nodal metastases, PSA, PSMA is quite specific, but simply not sensitive, sensitive enough because it still will only pick up a four millimeter lymph gland and nothing below. It is however better than our current techniques, including MRI, CT scan and bone scan. The negative predictive value of 80% means we are falsely reassured by a fifth and small nodes and the average nodal side is 2.7 millimeters are simply not picked up by. MRI has a role also in radiotherapy planning, although to date, most of this planning has been done by CT scan. The MR LINAC machine is combining the MRI machine to the uh, IMRT machine to enable the accuracy of MRI planning to the radiotherapy. And this is starting to evolve in Australia in addition to several sites, sites overseas. Active surveillance is also 
an, ex an excellent form of treatment for low-grade cancers after we've realized that these low-grade cancers are not life-threatening. MRI and transperineal biopsy have enabled us to more accurately detect and select patients for this treatment. And MRI has also helped us perform less biopsies in this group. Genetic markers are also helping in this area. The publication in the Journal of Urology by our group showed that active surveillance and MRI, MRI has helped le achieve less biopsies and more accurate staging in this group of people. And I think this is the beginning of a very large role of MRI in active surveillance. PSMA PET scan may also have a role here. This is a typical case where suddenly the PSA went up in a person on active surveillance and you can see on the left hand side a very small but quite low ADC lesion which turned out to be a Gleason 9 cancer and this would never have been picked up by random biopsies given its size. Genomics is also helping in those indecisive, well, in the people, the so-called grey zone, where they're a little bit too much for active surveillance, but a little bit too little for whole gland therapy. Here, we use genomics to try and decide whether a low-grade cancer uh, can be, needs to be treated, or a higher-grade cancer can be monitored. The current available markers typically are Oncocyte DX and Prolaris, and they may aid in decision-making in this group. Focal therapy is a new paradigm emerging worldwide for intermediate risk prostate cancer. Active surveillance for low risk, high risk for whole gland therapy, and possibly focal therapy for the intermediate risk. This is certainly not established and not in guidelines yet, but the reason why focal therapy is emerging partly is not only because of the over-treatment we've recognized in many patients with prostate cancer and the side effects of whole gland therapy, but also because of the more accurate assessment with MRI and template biopsies. Using MRI and template biopsies, it is possible to select patients for focal therapy much more accurately. It is important, however, to realize the MRI underestimates the tumor and it's always necessary in focal therapy to have at least a centimeter margin. The focal therapy that we use is the nano knife or irreversible electroporation. And in the 320 patients we treated, which we recent, recently published on, there was a 96% chance of being free of the cancer in the treated area and about a 12% chance of recurrent disease in the outfield over three years. The functional outcomes were excellent, almost 100% being pad free and 90% preserved potency. Here you can see a right hemiablation with a lot of swelling and then almost complete obliteration of the right lobe of the prostate by six months. Here you can see another use of MRI in the recurrence after radiotherapy, in this case, after low dose rate brachytherapy. Some simple tips in terms of the reporting. There's a lot of information a radiologist needs to report his MRI accurately. The current PSA level and velocity, the date and results of the biopsies, other history, including the digital examination, and whether you're on tablets like Avidart or Finasteride, which in which case you'll need to multiply the PSA by two as these tablets halve the PSA level. Prior treatments such as surgery or radiotherapy, prior prostate infections and family history are all useful to put into the report. On the MRI report, it's essential that the recent PSA and PSA density is, is recorded a comparison between previous MRIs 
and T2 and ADC axial views of the apex, mid and basal area. Regions of interest should be highlighted with arrows and the size of the prostate and the middle lobe made particular uh, reference to. Pyrads version 2.1 should use and the ure urethral length should be used. In general terms, a Pyrad 1 and 2 generally doesn't need a biopsy, a Pyrad 4 or 5 generally does, and a Pyrad 3 has a biopsy depending on other factors. Pyrad 4 and 5 has at least an 80% positive biopsy rate, Pyrad 1 or 2 less than 10% and Pyrad 3 about 20%. Measuring the volume of the prostate uses a formula of height, width and length times 0.523. And when you're mapping lesions, up to four lesions should be mapped. The index lesion is the one with the highest pyrate assessment. A low ADC does not necessarily mean cancer and can mean any one of these other conditions of the prostate. So, the PIRAD 2.1 version needs to take all that into consideration as well as perfusion. PIRAD 3 lesions are a particular concern. The prevalence of PIRAD 3 lesions varies between 20 and 30% and the prevalence of clinically significant cancer varies between 16 and 21%. Of extreme importance is the number of cases of PIRAD3 in your own practice needs to be carefully looked at because the higher that percentage, the more uncertainty there is in reporting either one and two or four and five. And you should be aiming to get your PIRAD3 rate below 15%. PIRAD3 in screening low risk patients, such as patients without a family history where the PSA is quite low, can in these cases be monitored with PSAs and MRI. Whereas PIRAD3 in higher risk patients, people with family histories, people who are young, or people who've developed a PIRAD3 lesion, need a targeted and systematic biopsy. If there are other indications for biopsy, such as family history or BRCA gene status, then obviously targeted and systematic biopsy is indicated, particularly if the PSA is going up rapidly. There are many pitfalls in MRI, and these are just some of those for anatomical structures, such as the central zone, thickening of the surgical capsule, periprostatic veins and neurovascular bundles, and non-cancerous abnormalities that mimic tumours such as post-biopsy haemorrhage or granulomatous prostatitis, prostatitis or stromal modules. This is an example of a post-biopsy reaction, but interestingly, the actual cancer itself in the unbroken arrow still shows up quite clearly. Recently, there's been quite a a lot of interest in biparametric MRI to possibly replace multiparametric MRI. And there has, there has been a proposition that we do a proper randomized study to look at this. This of course would be an excellent 15 minute MRI as a screening tool. And more now to the future, there are different cancers on MRI and PSMA and different cancers in terms of how aggressive they are. And it is possible that these different imaging appearances could predict the phenotypes. For example, an MRI and PSMA positive versus a PSMA positive MRI negative, etc., could actually predict the aggressive nature of these tumors. There are large differences in gene expression between visible and non-visible lesions. And furthermore, the visible lesions are enriched for a progression phenotype. So this is an area of active research. I'd like to thank you for your attention. And again, thank you for the privilege of being able to take you through 
in a very limited fashion the role of MRI in prostate cancer. Thank you.